Okay. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Cameron Shorter, and I'm about to go and talk through the open source geospatial stack. And um, when you're talking about, well, when, when you're hearing a presentation, I think it's always very helpful to be able to know who it is your who it is who's talking to you. So, and and in, in this case, I am I work at LisaSoft. We are a systems integration company, effectively providing commercial services around the open source stack. And in particular, we have strong expertise in the geospatial realm, which we're about to talk about. Uh, we also know about infrastructure, and we've been providing support around databases and uh, Postgres database, which Tony will be talking about later on. Uh, and we also have quite a bit of expertise in the web and the mobile space. And of course, open source and open standards. And when, when I'm talking about open source, what, I actually, what we're actually about to talk about is uh, the, the, the full geospatial stack in, in the open source space. And this is effectively a, a 25 minute presentation which is compressed down from uh, the Phosphor G conference which walks around the, uh, around the world and, and we hosted here in Sydney in 2009. Uh, this conference is a, a, a three day conference, six streams running in parallel and you're about to see it in 20 minutes so please excuse me if we're a little bit, uh, a little bit brief in some, of, in some of these applications. Uh, also in particular, the, the, this information is available on the live DVD, which, which you can see up, um, up, up on the screen there. And this DVD has documentation for each of these projects, and if you actually want some more information, I suggest you have a look at uh, the live.osgeo.org site. So, when we're talking about the geospatial stack, the, um, there, there are some very good standards that have been around for the last 10 years that it's effectively based upon a service-oriented architecture. So at the bottom you have the database, it then moves up into the web services and, uh, and, and a web services layer uh, for which you have uh, a, a number of open standards for. And then on the top you've got the mobile, the desktop and the mobile type applications um, which are specifically querying those standards. So, and, and uh, probably it's probably worthwhile going through and talking through some of these standards. So, the um, the key the key standard that came out first was something called the web map server, standard, web, web map service, and the web map service is for images. Um, a, a slight variant on that is for the web map tile service, which shows these images as specific tiles. And you probably notice that when you go and look at Google. Google Maps that the tiles come down, uh, and, and, or the images come down in specific tiles as they come through. Uh, the web coverage service is, is, another, is another variant on the image service in that each pixel represents a, uh, in each color of the pixel represents a value. So if you're talking about the, the temperature of the ocean, for instance, you might see down in Antarctica all the, the pixels are blue. Um, but up towards the equator, the pixels might be red, and each one of these pixels have a, have a value. And on top of that, in the web coverage service, it, each pixel can have multiple values. So you can actually have uh, temperature, as well as wind speed, as well as salinity, and so on and so on. Uh, Images are good, but in order to be able to do analysis on the, on the data, you really need to be able to get access to the, the actual vector data behind that. And uh, for vector data, that, that's things like lines and polygons and, uh, and, and, and points, and the web service to support that is the web feature service. Uh, once you've created lots of data sets, you then need to be able to find them, and that's where the web catalog service comes in, into play. Um, it's, it's effectively a, a place where you store the metadata about the service. Uh, and then the one I really like is the web processing services, which, which is really quite cool. It, it's used to go and pass an algorithm down to the server and then let the processing be done on the server and then you come back with just a result. It's a particularly useful thing for, for very large and dynamic data sets, something like the weather, where the 
um, where you might have an aeroplane wanting to say, how do I get from Sydney to Melbourne and board the storm? And you send the query down, the crunching is done down on the server, and you just get a like, small um, line string comes back to you, which tells you which way you need to go. So what I'll do now is I'm going to go and talk through some of the use cases that you would use, and I'll start by working through the desktop applications to provide those use cases. Um, there are a number of these desktop clients, a lot of them do reasonably similar things, and I'm afraid I'm just going to have to skim through many of them, and I'll, I'll just focus in on, on, uh, on, on a couple. Um, starting with QGIS. Now, uh, QGIS is the desktop application that's really starting to get traction here in Australia, and it's really taking on the proprietary desktop vendors that have already uh, claimed this space uh, 20 or so years ago. Um, what, what, you, what, what you're really looking for in a desktop application is something where you can view and edit uh, a, a map, create unique maps, go and style them the way you like them, um, go and uh, label them, symbolize them. You also want to be able to import and export data sets. So once you've, uh, when, you, when you're starting, you want to be able to connect to uh, databases or shapefiles or whatever they happen to be, merge them together. Um, and then once you finish, you want to be able to save that and, and uh, store it out. Um, once, well, well, one of the, the key use cases and one of the reasons why you need maps is actually to do analysis on these types of maps and, and to work out um, how you can do that. And, and, and QGIS is one of those applications that people use to be able to achieve that. So uh, this might be where you want to compare maps. So for instance, you might need to, and here's a very Australian example, you might need to be able to drink beer. So you, you want to be able to work out where you want to put a pub. So you go and work out where the, uh, go look at the, the crime statistics of where all the people have been arrested for drinking too much alcohol, and then go and focus in on the, um, on that particular area and uh, build, your, build your pub, you know, Looking at, looking at where the, the, the roads intersect and so forth, and, and, and providing that sort of analysis, you might uh, then come to the conclusion that uh, right in the middle of Sydney is a perfect spot for a park. Um, terrain analysis, that's where you are going in and looking at the, the, the terrain and working out the heights of the mountains and things, and then working out where the rivers might go. Network analysis is things like working out how to get from one location to another along the roads and working out how the roads connect and, and working out the best path to get from one to the other. Uh, and, and there's millions of other use cases that, that, uh, that the spatial use cases people make use of and, and QGIS is, is becoming one of the, the leaders in this space. Uh, one of the other reasons that QGIS has really taken off and has become successful is it has a very strong, a very good plug-in architecture. Um, that, uh, so you can basically go and write your own plugins based on Python to, to meet your business requirements. And QGIS is one of the applications that this stuff provides training in, um, and, and, and uh, if you wanted to get more details, uh, go and check out our website. I'm going to skim through some of the other applications here. Grass is uh, a very powerful application, but QGIS is actually uh, providing a front end to access many of the algorithms that are available that have been built up in, in Grass. GVC has a very nice story behind it in that it was uh, a, a Spanish uh, Department of Transport went in and decided to go completely open source and they went in and for the, the desktop client application that uh, didn't exist at the time of the proprietary, they went in and completely wrote their own and as a consequence, they have a very powerful application which has a very strong Spanish following behind it. UDIG fits, is a Java-based application, fits in with the Eclipse framework, um, quite often used where you would like to uh, have a good programming interface that fits in with the Eclipse framework. OpenJump, another Java project, Cosmo, Saga, I'm afraid I'm running through very quickly here. Um, Map Window is built based in .NET, and as a consequence, uh, it, it fits into with the um, in, in with the .NET Windows based framework. Uh, the Open Scene Graph Graph Earth is is, is uh, a beautiful site. I love this one. Is uh, basically gives you three three dimensional rendering using Open Scene Graph, which is a, a three dimensional rendering tool. 
and that brings us through to the browser. So what used to be only available in the desktop is now available in the browser. And the key project in this space is, is OpenLayers. OpenLayers has, has really dominated the, um, the, the browser space um, and is the, the primary tool of choice for most of the other browser-based applications. It allows you to go and access um, a, a, a variety of, of base maps, so OpenStreetMap, Google, Bing, as well as the OGC standards like Web Map Service, Web Feature Service, KML, and so forth. Uh, provides all the tools, the pan, zoom, query. Uh, it allows drawing, editing, sending data back via web, uh, via the web tra transactional web feature servers, and it's one of the, uh, the libraries that we provide training in here at Lisasoft as well. Uh, Mapfish is, is, uh, provides some of the, the back-end tools. Uh, it also integrates with, with open layers and provides tools in, in particular, uh, printing is quite often used, uh, provided through the Mapfish client. MapVendor is another portal framework. Again, I believe they're moving towards open layers. GeoMyas is a, uh, GeoMyas is a browser-based application where a lot of the, the complex uh, query and or, or, or spatial functions is actually done on the server rather than in the client and gives a bit more power in that space. Geomoose is, um, and now we're starting to get into specific portals that uh, have specific functions, and this has been targeted at the local government space. Um, and I'll skim through to, so crisis management is, is a, 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 a one of the, the nice uses for open source, and, and Usha Hindi is one of these projects which grew out of South African violence that, that started getting mapped and people were putting SMS messages onto the web and, and popping them and, and then being able to interact and find people and, and disasters quite often uh, make use of Russian India as soon as they, they happen it comes up online. Um, so Hana is another disaster management project again used to coordinate uh, people in, in disaster situations. Um, and there's a few more but I'm going to move through to the web services. And this is the next level down. Um, and these are primarily services that are supporting the open standards. And here in Australia, probably the, the, the key deployment that we're seeing and, and starting to dominate the space is this GeoServer. Uh, primarily because it is being, it has had quite a bit of development from CSIRO and the uh, and, and, and the part of sponsored with the Bureau of Meteorology and, and a few other departments. And they have gone in and, and put a, quite a bit of effort into supporting GeoServer and, and some of the more complex functionality in there. But it allows you to publish your data as web map servers, web map tile services, web feature servers, web coverage services, web processing services, connects to numerous data sources, databases, vector, raster, proprietary, open source, um, allows uh, Web administration allows you to load your data and configure data. And again, this is one that we are regularly providing training for here, here at LisaSoft. Um, going hand in hand with GeoServer is, is GeoNetwork. And GeoNetwork it provides your metadata catalog. So that, uh, that, that allows you to go in and store information about data. Um, so that's the, the title of data sets, the location of where the data set's appropriate, um, the, the author, the, the data was created, the level of quality of the data set, all, all those sorts of metadata type things. And um, that's another one that we are providing training for here at Lisasoft. Uh, QGIS Server, we talked about QGIS before, if you actually want to publish to the internet, QGIS Server actually allows you to take a configuration file from QGIS, put it onto the server, and you have maps that look just like you've made them in, on, on QGIS desktop. 52 degrees north, um, so um, provides a web security service, and that allows you to go and say, this particular user over here, you are allowed to update and maintain the data within your region but nowhere else. So you, you've got that uh, granularity of locking features down, lock, locking data down by a region. Sensor observation services, a sensor is anything that measures things. So water in a stream, 
or the water level in a stream or the flow, or it could even be a sensor on a satellite. They, they, they all need to collect information and to be able to control it and publish it rather that that's where the sensor information service comes in. And these are some of the, the, the more recent applications, the more, more recent standards that have come about. And we found with these newer standards that open source is really taking uh, traction and it, it, it's, it's demonstrating itself as, as one of the better business models to get and, and faster to, to get uh, the, the software behind the standards up and running. Map server is quite similar to GeoServer, uh, pretty much competes head to head. It's C based, has a very strong community behind it. Um, tiny OWS and OWS is a transactional extension to Map Server. Degree is a um, Map Server with strong footprint in Germany, uh, lots of users in Germany. Um, High CWS is another metadata catalog, quite a light version of it. Um, then we've got Map Proxy uh, for, for, for providing proxies for pushing data out. Uh, Map Tyler. Um, then we've got some web processing services. Web processing services, as I mentioned before, were for the uh, putting an algorithm down on the server, and there's a few of these applications. The 52 degrees north has one, um, and the GeoServer I mentioned before. Um, Earth observations are viewing of the, the viewing of the Earth and, and satellite images of the Earth, and, and there's, uh, they're usually published through a catalog service. And for that, we've got Exo Server and, and Runs Demand both provide that type of functionality. App. So I apologise if I'm going too fast. We're now through into the databases. Um, and at the bottom of the stack, we have Postgres. Postgres has become the de facto standard. Actually, I probably should say Postgres with the PostGIS extensions. Uh, PostGIS especially enables the Postgres functions. It basically provides hundreds of special functions, all the join type functions and, and, the, um, and, and, the, and the, the constructors for being able to query and store uh, spatial data. Uh, it allows you to you, you can import and export it, you can do the routing using PG routing. It's very stable, very fast. Uh, it's been, it's standards compliant, compliant and uh, has been around for quite some time. It's, uh, and of course, this is one that we provide training in, uh, in your place soft again. PG routing, I just mentioned, uh, provides how to get from A to B functionality into Postgres. Uh, Specialized, I, I just think Specialized is really cool. It's, it, um, it, it supports the, it's, it's, it provides special extensions to the SQLite database, which is a database inside a file, so very lightweight, and you can embed it into nice small applications. Which brings us down to the map data. So all of this functionality is completely useless unless you actually have some data behind it and we have some very good data to be able to tap into and free data at that. The natural earth data is a complete data set of the entire world. It has vector data, physical data, as well as, uh, and, and has it in both for the, the, the physical um, layers like rivers and country boundaries and so forth, as well as the, the political, like cities and, um, and, and roads and so forth. Um, there's OpenStreetMap. Uh, this is the crowdsourced version of the, uh, of, of the map of the world and has been incredibly successful uh, at a macro level, uh, at the, the country level. There. It, it, it provides an excellent data set um, and, and web service that you can tap into. Uh, at the micro level, in some places, it is better quality than the proprietary data sets you've had. You, that is basically where you find all your geo geeks in, uh, in specific areas. Some other places, it's not as good. It's, uh, it, it basically depends on, on how, uh, how geeky your community is. Um, but it's certainly good enough. I've, we, we've in, installed OpenStreetMap into uh, government sites before, so it, it's, it's certainly good enough for, for uh, use in, in many web mapping applications. The North Carolina educational data set is, is, has a, it's very useful for educational type things. It's, it's got a range of different types of applications. Um, which brings us down, if I've got enough time to, I'll like to skim through some of the special tools. Um, 
GeoKettle is an extract transform load data set which allows you to go and enter a workflow in. So this is where you go and have a repetitive process where you are pulling data out of, out of some form, you're going processing it, running through an algorithm or two, and then putting it back into another format uh, somewhere else. Um, it is. Uh, it, 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 it has, a, it has a, a, a GUI interface, so you can uh, theoretically hand it over to someone who's not a programmer to, to set it up and drive it. Um, and, uh, and, and we've been using this, it's quite good. It's, uh, if, if you're in the geospatial world, it's similar to FME, and uh, if you're in the, in, in the open source world, it, in the database world, it, it's, it extends the Kettle or the, the, the Tahoe data integration data set. Um, if you are uh, trying to push this into your grandmother's programming, uh, grandmother, you, you don't want to go down with the R statistical programming language, but it's very good if you're a, uh, into statistical type programming, then R is talked, and there are some, some very good uh, powerful functions in there. You do, do a lot of really powerful stuff with it. And uh, for image processing, there is awesome and uh, our FPO toolbox uh, published um, awesome is sponsored by the US Defense Department uh, uh, FPO toolbox is from the uh, US French Space Agency um, and they've got some very powerful tools in there uh, and then there's also the generic uh, mapping tools as well which provides um, tools for, for XY processing um, navigation I'm going to really skim through this uh, for this navigation of maps. There's GPS tracking, GPS navigation, um, open sea pan for marine type navigation, Viking more GPS uh, navigation. Uh, this nice forecasting map is with Z, Z Y grid. Um, and then there's a very nice spinning globe, a bit like Google Earth, uh, provided by Marvel in the KDE project. Uh, because you're all um, spatial peaks, I'll give you a quick uh, look at the geospatial libraries. Um, just because you're programmers, you should be able to understand this. Java Topology Suite is the, uh, it provides you with, with the spatial algorithms to you know, do things like uh, compare and, and has constructs. Um, if you prefer it in C and C++, then you can go and use Geos, which uh, JTS has been uh, moved across to, uh, also available in Python. And uh, JTS is also embedded into GeoTools, which actually extends the JTS to also provide connections to databases, rendering engines, uh, and, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, for data transformation, you're looking at the GDAL and OGR transform. You can see from that list up there, there is a significant number of formats that people store their spatial data in. Um, and GDAL helps out there. MetaCRS is actually a collection of a number of data uh, of, uh, projects and they are to do with converting the coordinate reference system of, a, um, of the world. The world's round and we continually draw it on a flat piece of paper and as a consequence we keep on getting it wrong depending if you're looking at the, the Earth at the uh, Antarctic or, or at, from, uh, from the equator you keep on getting different types of maps and the CRS will transfer the MetaCRS projects will transform from one to the other. Uh, LibLAS is um, to do with collecting data for, and, and tools for around the um, LiDAR library. Uh, LiDAR is um, basically like Sona. You, you send a message down to the ground, you get to bounce back and you work out um, whether you've got mountains below you or, or flat land or something like that. MapNIC is for rendering maps, make them beautiful, um, famously because it's behind the OpenStreetMap project. And that's where we're in. The, there's lots and lots of people who've been involved in creating the material behind this. This is the Ausgeo Live project, and these are the people directly involved in creating this and the, the documentation. Any questions? Um, my name is Cameron Shorter. You can find out more information about this project um, on the Ausgeo Live website, where these, each of these projects is described in more detail. And uh, if you want to ask any more questions, I, I'm, I'm open, uh, also available, um, we've got training for, for a number of those things I mentioned earlier as well.